that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that, he said to them, then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. This is not justification for paying high taxes. It's just not. It's just not. I was thinking about, well, what would be something clever to say? I won't say anything clever. You know, I'll quit paying tax. You know, I'll, I'll quit griping about paying taxes once you quit wait. You know, quit wasting my money or something like that. Something good and Christian. But what we have here is politics are being played. So let let's a couple of details that in reading you know, some of the commentators on this that I've pulled out of this. The first thing is that you've got. I mean, here's the here's the entire situation is that they are trying to trick our Lord. And, and the first thing that they do is they say, ah, we know that you're a teacher. You teach the truth. So they're buttering him up. Of course, he's God. Of course he teaches the truth. So he's teaching the truth. And they say, boy, you, you teach in accordance with the law. You teach in the court. So now let me ask you this simple little tiny question. And it's very duplicitous because they're trying to trick him. And you, I'm sure most of you have heard this before. But if he says, no, you don't have to pay the, the tax to Caesar, then they're going to take that information and testimony against him straight to the Roman authority who runs the place, and they're going to have him arrested for insurrection or being a, a, you know, a rebel, anything like that, and he'll be thrown in jail or executed, you know, thrown in jail for the rest of his life. So they're going to trap him that way if he says, no, don't bother paying the tax. Caesar doesn't need our money. That, you know, they're an unlawful authority that's, that's running our lives. And if he, that's if he says don't. If he says do, then, and of course if he says don't do it, then he'll be religiously appealing to people like the zealots and maybe some of the others who, as, who strictly want to rebel against Rome. And if he says yes, you know, go ahead and pay the tax to Caesar, then, all, then one half of the folks are gonna say, well, you're just colluding with the Romans anyway. And here's why they would say that, because here's, this is, this is a big detail that we kind of have to know, is that the Pharisees and the Herodians who have, oh, by the way, they did not like each other, generally speaking. The Pharisees who ran the synagogues and who were in charge of what was going on in the temple, because they had purchased that right of the temple from the Roman authority. The Herodians, they were much more secular. They really weren't particularly religious. They were the ones who had endeared themselves to the Herodian, the, the Herod, to that empire, to that ruling class. Those two did not get along with each other. The Pharisees, the Herodians, they fought. But they've made an unholy political alliance here to go after the Lord. So they're trying to trap him. They've given him a question that is the no, as Star Trek folks would know, the no-win scenario. You, you, if you say, yes, pay the tax, or no, don't pay the tax, you're going to anger a very healthy portion of the folks. And so back to my point about, here's something to know. The Pharisees and the Herodians and the Sadducees they were profiting immensely by what was going on in Jerusalem, specifically what was going on into the temple. What was happening, and, and governments through the course of times do this, they make certain populations happy so that there will be somewhat of peace. They were, they were becoming wealthy from the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Rome was permitting a temple tax to go out throughout the entire Roman Empire. What was that temple tax? Well, every person of Jewish descent or any believer within the Hebrew faith, anybody they would probably figure, I don't know how they'd figure it out, but probably be based upon if they would go to Jerusalem to uh, Passover time. But there would have been millions of the Jewish or Hebrew religion, faith, the one true faith at that time, there would have been uh, millions who would have been paying that temple tax from all throughout. So whether you were in Syria or whether you were in Jerusalem or Galilee or North Africa or Italy 
or Germania or anywhere, you were assessed two days wages tax, so two denarius, two denarii. So two days wages of which you would have to pay that to the tax collector, the Roman authority, and it went to Jerusalem to pay for the temple. That was the temple tax. Well, there was, that's massive wealth that's coming in. And so that's enriching the Pharisees. They're living well. As an aside, in one part of the Gospels, some, and I, I should have looked it up, someone says, you know, how can we follow all the prescriptions of the law? You would have to be rich to be able to do that. The Pharisees didn't have any other job. They didn't need a job. They were immensely wealthy just being Pharisees because they were raking in all this dough from the temple tax. The point about I need to be rich in order to follow all the pharisaical prescriptions of the law is because anybody else who had a job, they would have to spend all of, they, they would not be able to keep up with knowing everything in the law, everything in the prophets, everything in the scriptures, they would not have enough time to study that and to be in accord with all those tiny details and still have a job. So only the Pharisees would be able to, and so they kept keeping these little rules and these regulations, such as dietary restrictions and how to wash a cup and not to touch a, a dead body and all these things but they had plenty of money. And Jesus is coming in, and he's not politically correct, I guess we could say, because he is trying to get them to look at life entirely different. They have really thrown in their lot with the Roman authority. They have the temple, and they have the authority to run the temple. They've made nice with the Herodians against Christ. So they've, again, they've got this unholy alliance. So what is to be done? How do we apply this? They're trying to get Christ to be in this no-win answer. And of course, he answers to them, well, give to whose image is that? And on the coin. And there is, I think, the something that's that word is important for us to know. That image, where else is the image used in scripture, in Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis, when God creates in his image, or in, as it's quoted in Genesis chapter one, let us create man in our image. Let us create him man and female in our image, image. So Jesus doesn't say, well, whose face is on the coin? He says, whose image, using the same terminology as is used in, Gen in Genesis chapter 1. The image on the coin is of Caesar, well then give it to Caesar. If that's his image, that's his image. We are created in the image of God, which means that we should weigh every decision not based upon Caesar, politics, not based upon if we are being enriched. It's based, every decision that I make, is it based upon Am I helping or harming my salvation? Every decision that I ought be making, is it in accord with God's truth or is it in accord with man's? Am I basing everything on the image of Caesar, on the image of politics, on the image of my own worldly gain? Or am I basing it knowing that I have been created in the image of God, just in my creation. And then when I was baptized, I received an indelible mark of Christ upon my soul. So not only do I look what God would see himself as doing, his image, every one of us is a revelation of God and his creation and what God would look like. Every one of us is that revelation, but also on my soul in baptism, I received that indelible mark where I radiate Christ. So I know I not only look like God in his creation, I look like God in his being because I have Christ to my soul. Are my decisions based upon that? Or are my decisions based upon worldliness? Christ is trying to get them away from worldliness. He's trying to get us away from worldliness. 
a topic of the scriptures in, uh, in the Gospels. Our Lord is talking about renouncing worldliness in order to embrace the cross and embrace the supernatural. The Pharisees and the Herodians did not recognize God. They did not want to recognize God because they had it good. They had the temple. They had the temple tax. They were wealthy. They had authority. They had esteem in the eyes of the people. But they didn't recognize God. They did not recognize his image. So in all of the decisions that we make, may we make all of those decisions based upon our faith, our standing with Almighty God, our standing within the church, what direction is the church pushing us towards? And let us not reject him, but instead let us live, having been created in his image, and let us live for the Lord. God love you. Let us now stand and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father, 